Coming up on WUFT First at Five, we're taking a live look at Newberry High School where voting is happening on a charter conversion. We tell you what parents are saying about the proposed change. Plus, the solar eclipse is just around the corner. Local schools want to make sure your kids are safe. We have the details in just a couple of minutes. And April is a Child Abuse Prevention Month. Bringing awareness to the issue is at the top of local officials' minds. First at Five starts right now. First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. The proposed change to convert Newberry schools to a charter program is now in the hands of voters. Welcome to First at Five. I'm Bianca Smith. And I'm Lauren Miranda. This change has been at the top of parents' discussion for weeks, and now they have seven days left to decide. WUFT's Kennedy Chambers is live at Newberry High School. Kennedy, parents and community members have a lot at stake in this one. Newberry Public Schools will be converted to charters. Parents and teachers can drop off their ballots here at the high school, Oakview Middle School, or Newberry Elementary School. Ballots can also be mailed in order for the conversion to succeed. Half of the households with students at each school must cast a ballot. Teachers who do not vote will be counted as a no vote. Voting ends April 12th and does not include the weekends. Live from Newberry, Kennedy Chambers, WUFT News. Prepare your eclipse glasses because next week viewers from all over the state and across the country will have the chance to view a rare celestial phenomenon. Florida is not in the path of totality, but residents will see a partial solar eclipse. People on the northwest side of the state will be able to get a better look at this spectacle, and officials continue to warn everyone to stay safe during the event. Alachua County Public Schools are taking precautions as the solar eclipse is set to ascend. Schools will not hold outdoor activities between 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. All activities will be held indoors or canceled and postponed. Officials advise to wear certified solar eclipse protection during these hours. Bus drivers and teachers plan to remind students throughout the day to not look at the sun. If preferred, parents have the opportunity to check out their child early from school with an authorized note. It might be tempting to take off those glasses, but looking directly at the solar eclipse or any part of the exposed sun without eye protection can damage your eyes. The solar eclipse will take place on Monday, April 8th. And anyone would be lucky to even catch a glimpse at this once in a lifetime opportunity as the next eclipse won't be until 2044. But UF forecaster Ben Gedkars Davies joins us now with the weather forecast. Ben, looks like this weekend is going to be good for those outdoor eclipse prep activities. That's right, Lauren. This weekend, we're going to have sunny skies and warm conditions, perfect for watching that eclipse on Monday. Behind me is the path of totality for the eclipse, and although Florida isn't quite near it, we should still get about 60% viewing for that eclipse, just around 3 p.m. Looking at the cloud coverage for Monday for that eclipse, you can see we have very light cloud coverage here in Gainesville, largely dissipating by the afternoon when we would be viewing that eclipse. Looking at our campus cam, you can see those clear skies will have those clouds moving in throughout the weekend. Current temperatures in the mid 70s, but taking a dip this evening as we look at our evening planner with an 11 degree drop from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So it's going to start to feel chilly and with those winds, you're going to want to make sure to grab a windbreaker. Hackers broke into the computer network of the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice in Tallahassee. The network runs the state's juvenile detention centers and programs to steer kids away from crime. The hack shut down the main system used to manage cases statewide. Reportedly, the hackers were seeking a ransom to re restore the agency's systems. The break-in happened last week when an employee opened an infected email. The outage prevented employees from uploading records needed by judges in upcoming court hearings and caused employees to lose access to case records. For the full scope of this story, visit WUFT.org. This summer, the face of Gain one of Gainesville's lowest income communities is set to change. In 2022, Gainesville Community Reinvestment Area made a commitment to economically transform East Gainesville. WUFT's Jared Titel attended a news conference and joins us now to tell us how things may change. Alachua County data reports nearly 80% of all affordable housing is concentrated in East Gainesville and nearly a third of Gainesville's population resides in this region. Now, Gainesville officials are taking steps to reintegrate this quote forgotten part of town. Cornerstone Campus at Southeast Hawthorne Road is expanding more than 35 acres to include a UF Health Clinic and an RTS Transit Station. These are two additions Gainesville officials say Easterners both desire and deserve, long overshadowed by more revenue generating areas. The communities that need funding the most generally aren't developing as much as, say, downtown communities. 
The Cornerstone Campus and Eastside Health and Economic Development Initiative is divided into two phases. Cornerstone Phase 1 involves the Gainesville Technology Entrepreneurship Center. Well, you know, we're helping people get you know, from their kitchen table into their own office and then ultimately grow into other spaces in the community. Behind me is a roadway being constructed for the new east side location of the University of Florida Health Urgent Care Center. This 9,000 square foot facility it was dedicated over two and a quarter million dollars by the city and the county and its doors are expected to open as early as June or July. Cornerstone Phase 2 involves the development of the UF Health Urgent Care Center and the RTS Transit Hub. Everybody who, who gets on a bus and is part of that system is going to see a benefit uh, to, to their user experience because of this transit hub. The city bus station is set to include offices, public restrooms, and about 50 park and ride stations. Gainesville Community Reinvestment Area says this will prepare people to work, play, and explore east. Additional developments in East Gainesville at this time include the plan for an up to 30,000 square foot grocery store with a pharmacy. The only USDA approved grocery store in the area at this time is a Walmart in Northeast Gainesville. The Alachua County Public Works Department is expected to lead this project. Reporting live in the newsroom, Jared Titel, WUFT News. The City of Ocala is hosting a fair housing community event. The event will take place on Thursday, April 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Mary Sue Ritz Community Center at Reed Place. This event is meant to give people information on banking, budgeting, and other topics. Guest speakers will be in attendance to give people advice and insight. That is, the city says the goal is to empower people with knowledge and connections to key services. No registration is required and it is free and open to everybody. Alachua County's pilot housing program tackles homelessness with a creative permanent housing solution. WUFT's Carolina Tortorelli has details on this project. There are hundreds of unhoused residents on the streets of Alachua County. We're really struggling with having enough housing for folks, both in terms of regular workforce housing as well as permanent supportive housing. Taking that into account, the County Commission approved a new pilot housing program. The project provides almost 100 new homes along Southwest 13th Street. Alasha County recently purchased two motels, the Scottish and Boja Inn. They are currently being renovated into 67 apartments for permanent housing. 29 shipping containers will also be converted into small homes in additional purchased land. This will almost double the current permanent supportive housing. Usually we think about building from the ground up, but this allows us to use um, a sustainable project and to re reuse it. The county received $9.5 million in grant funding for the construction and renovation of the area. Each unit will include a kitchenette and a bathroom. Board Commissioner Anna Pritzia says they hope to provide them with more than just a roof. Is um, not just a home but also provides wraparound case management services for those individuals that need extra help with mental health counseling, possibly substance abuse counseling, as well as just life skills training. Carolina Tortorelli, WUFT News. The project is expected to be completed in 2025. Coming up on WUFT News First at 5, how Alachua County is coming together to honor a Child Abuse Prevention Month. Then, an earthquake impacts the lives of New Yorkers and other Northeastern residents. All that and more when First of Five returns. You're watching WUFT-TV News. A 4.8 magnitude earthquake rattled the Northeast. The light earthquake was felt from Maryland to Maine. This is the strongest earthquake to hit New Jersey in 250 years. Due to the tremor, flights to nearby areas were held according to the FAA. Still, schools continue to operate as normal. Governor Kathy Hochul says that there are no life-threatening damages, but asks emergency teams throughout the state to be on high alert for dangerous situations. UF's weather team breaks down what happened. That's right, the earthquake epicenter was 30 miles east of Newark, New Jersey, disturbing nearby residents at 10.23 a.m. It happened along the Ramapo Fault, which was originally formed during the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. This fault is usually inactive, so this earthquake took many by surprise. At a 4.8 out of 8 on the Richter scale, today's earthquake was strong enough to be felt by those in the region and to cause slight damage. Luckily, no significant damages have been reported at this time. Community members in Alachua County came together to make a pinwheel garden in honor of Child Abuse Prevention Month.
The Florida Department of Children and Families says that in 2023, the number of verified cases of child abuse was 2,123. Planting pinwheels in the garden is a tradition the Alachua County Children's Trust community members partake in yearly. They wear blue to honor child abuse survivors. Children's Trust Executive Director Marsha Kinner says the meaning magnifies the message. The color blue uh, is a symbol of vitality. Um, some might say it's soothing. Um, and for children, uh, it can create uh, a symbolism uh, of optimism. Alachua County's chair of the Child Abuse Prevention Task Force, Kathy Winthry, works to address child abuse. They all care about the safety and welfare of children, and so we all come together as a task force um, to think of different initiatives that we can do to keep the children of Alachua County safe. The trust, along with the task force, is hosting a Celebrate the Child event at Albert Ray Massey Park on April 20th to continue to bring awareness to the issue. The Children's Trust of Alachua County urges the community to learn more about child abuse and how to recognize it. To learn more, please visit childwelfare.org. Reporting in Alachua County, Morgan Plotka, WUFT News. Although we had dry and warm conditions this weekend, we have a wet weather system coming in next week with possible severe conditions. I'll time that out for you after the break. You're watching WUFT TV News. This stretch of crystal clear blue skies above Century Tower has been around the past couple of days, but we're going to have some clouds popping up soon. What you can't see here is the wind. Current wind speeds in Gainesville are 13 miles per hour, but wind gusts are even higher. 20 miles per hour here in Gainesville and even higher along the coast near Jacksonville or down south near Ocala where it's in those mid to upper 20s, those wind gusts. These are coming from the Gulf where we have this high pressure system making its way towards us, which is also contributing to those nice conditions and clear skies that we've had. Looking at the tonight lows, they're currently in those upper 40s and will be just a little bit chillier than we've been experiencing the past couple of days. Continuing on to look at our temperature change for the past day, we have an eight degree difference here in Gainesville and that trend is going to be continuing throughout the weekend as we're going to continue that warm up. For Saturday, for our weekend planner, we have those lows starting in the early morning in those upper 40s, but quickly increasing to those mid 70s in the afternoon with a similar trend on Sunday, even a little bit warmer as we have that warming continuing throughout the day. You can see clouds have spotted up on Sunday that have not been present for Saturday or the past couple of days. Looking at our pollen forecast for today and tomorrow, we do still have low pollen conditions due to, to the rain that came in earlier this week. But Sunday and Monday, we're going to reset to that typical high that we've been experiencing for a lot of March and April so far. Continuing to look at our muggy meter, we have these pleasant conditions that we've been experiencing for today and tomorrow and through the weekend, but it's going to get just a little bit more humid as we start to get into that week. And part of that is that frontal system that's going to be coming through Wednesday and Thursday that I'll be timing out for you now. We can see it comes into our region first Wednesday afternoon, late evening, but it doesn't really make landfall for getting us too wet until those early morning Thursday hours. We have slight chance of severe storms, but it should be mainly spotty showers and out of our hair by those late afternoon Friday evening. Looking ahead at our seven day forecast, you can see Saturday that warming trend starting and continuing all the way through Wednesday for its peak in those mid 80s. We have we've got that solar eclipse happening on Monday around 3 p.m. Make sure to grab your glasses and some rain coming in Thursday, dropping that temperature for Friday as we get into next weekend. And it's a little bit cooler temps than we'll feel this upcoming week. Up next, Gator Baseball continues SEC play. Plus, Gators Gymnastics gets ready for NCAA Regionals. All that and more after the break. You're watching WUFT TV News. Happy Friday. Let's talk sports. I'm Jamie Goldman. NCAA Regional Gymnastics action is taking place right here in Gainesville. WFT's Ben McLeish is live on the scene. Ben, the Gators have found lots of success in regionals, making it through to nationals the last three seasons. That's right, Jamie. Gator Gymnastics will face off against Iowa State, Georgia, and Missouri tonight in the second round of the Gainesville Regional. 
the two top teams of tonight's matchup will move on to the Gainesville Regional Finals on Sunday. Earlier today, Utah and Michigan State shined right here in the O'Connell Center, earning themselves a spot in the Regional Finals. On Sunday, the four remaining teams will compete with the top two teams advancing to the NCAA Championships in Fort Worth, Texas. The Gators will begin at 7 with hopes of making another championship run in Fort Worth. WUFT's Reagan Shepard had a chance to sit down with Gator freshman gymnast Anya Pilgrim ahead of tonight's matchup. Anya Pilgrim. A name that's gained lots of attention over the last year. She's left quite a mark on Gator gymnastics and she's only a freshman. There is not one thing, um, not just gymnastics, her personality, her thoughtfulness, her competitiveness, her um, just will to make whatever happen happen. Um, you can't you can't teach that. The first year gymnast out of Maryland has already made herself among the greatest to ever compete in the O-Dome. Pilgrim put up the highest all-around score to date by any Gator freshman in their debut meet. And while others may find glory in record books and accolades, for Pilgrim, that experience was purely about saving a moment she would never get back. We started on vault, which is my favorite event, so one of the coaches from the other team had told me, because he'd been to some Gator camps, he was like, when you land, just take it all in, because that's the first and last time you'll ever like have that experience and I was like you're right. Pilgrim and the Stellar Gator team ended as regular season SEC leaders but took a dip at the SEC championships coming out fourth. As they prepare for the start of the NCAA tournament tonight in the regional round of competition, Pilgrim said this week of much needed rest is exactly what they needed to put up a performance this team is proud of. I think that was our 11th meet or something so we're exhausted. So I think it's really good that we're going to have this week before regionals to really get ourselves back on track and push that whatever happened under the rug. So I think we'll be in a good spot. The Gators take the floor tonight in the O'Connell Center at 7 p.m. Reagan Shepard, WUFT News. Shifting gears to the diamond, Gators baseball continues SEC play as they head to Missouri to face the Tigers tonight. Missouri has struggled in SEC play so far this season, posting a 1-8 record and batting 144 in conference games. Florida has dominated this series in recent years, winning 20 of the past 21 games against Missouri. The Gators will look to keep that trend going as they open up a three-game series with the Tigers tonight. First pitch set for seven. Gators softball has a top 10 matchup on their hands this weekend as they welcome the LSU Tigers into Gainesville. Both teams enter this series on a hot streak as the Gators have won 11 of their last 12 and the Tigers have won six in a row. Florida is also riding a 12 game home winning streak. Game one of the three game series is set for tomorrow at six. Before we go, we have finally reached the final four in women's college basketball. Undefeated South Carolina gets things going tonight as they take on NC State. Following that is a must-see matchup between Caitlin Clark's Iowa Hawkeyes and Paige Becker's UConn Huskies. Well, I'm officially a Caitlin Clark fan. She just got that swag on the court. Yeah, she is more than just an athlete. She's really well-rounded. Hey, don't sleep on UConn and Paige now. They're pretty well, good, too. We'll have to find out the rest this weekend. But before we go, let us know, is it basketball weather this weekend? Well, I'd argue any basketball weather is good weather. If you're playing outside on the court this weekend, you're going to have sunny skies and warm temperatures, a warming trend throughout the week up until the mid 80s on Wednesday. You're going to continue that on to Thursday where we have some rain coming in and a temperature drop for Friday. Monday's your solar eclipse, so make sure to grab your eclipse kit. Well, thank you for joining us. We're back here tomorrow. We're back here on a Monday for another edition of First at Five. But your North Central Florida news will always be on at WUFT.org and on all of our social media platforms. Go ahead, give us a follow and have a great night.